Hi, I'm Mara Webster with InCreative Company, and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. We are a year-round talk series bringing you the best creative voices across film, television, and theater. And today we are incredibly lucky to be joined by Bayan Junam to talk all about his latest series, uh, QAnon, The Search for Q on Vice. And I love the fact that you and Marley Clements, who's your co-creator, co-director, and co-host in this, both come with really different sensibilities. You come at this very much from the filmmaker perspective, producer side, and she comes more from having worked on political campaigns. So how do you feel that that gave you a really wide breadth of different avenues and conversations that you were able to come up with to explore throughout the series? Mm, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I think it just expanded the relatability of the show. I think that, you know, ideologically viewers were able to see within our conversation something that they could agree with. Um, and I think that, you know, Marley, given like her experiences uh, on Washington, saw the threat of QAnon in a much different way than I did. And for me, I think I always really wanted to understand the why, like what was drawing people by the millions to this anonymous digital profit to the point that they were willing to distance themselves from their friends and family. Um, and I think for Marley, it very much, you know, uh, QAnon represented a threat to the, the career path, the, the um, institutions that she had been working within for years. And so I think, you know, you, you see how that kind of affects the different way that we approach the, the topic. And we hope that we gave a spectrum of relatability between us. Yeah. And I, I really like the fact that you actually come into this entire series never claiming that you're going to find all of the answers and that you're going to present all of the solutions at the end of it. But it really is just about widening up the conversation and asking a lot of questions and obviously finding a lot of details and information along the way. Was that something that the two of you set out with as an intention right from the very beginning of conceptualizing this? Yeah, I mean, I think that very, <laughs> yeah, I like, I, I like how you put it. Um, for us, it was always about trying to advance the conversation from where we were seeing it happening on the news, which was only fostering further divisions between people who kind of believe in QAnon and people who are against QAnon. And it became very difficult for, I mean, me as a viewer to, again, understand the why behind all of this. And, and I, it was harder and harder to understand that through like an intermediary being like uh, an anchor on a news show or like Chuck Todd, you know, explaining it to me rather than just hearing it from Anons themselves. So our first intention was really to go out there and hear from Anons, like what is QAnon? Like from a believer's perspective, um, and answer that question. And then the question about who, I think on some level, we always knew that there's, a, you, you're never really going to know, you know, short of having, you know, a manifesto years prior that was published, even then it raises only more questions. And I think the question about who QAnon was, was really stuck between these two polar opposites, which was, you know, it's a, it could be some loser in his basement, you know, starting it as a troll, or maybe it's, you know, people close to the president. And those are wildly different assumptions to make. And they also have a very different level of threat that they presented to the American public. And so we wanted to try to parse out like where is their truth and facts within all of these assumptions that were being made and know that you know the documentary really represents our journey to find out the answers to those questions more so than claiming that we have the answer to those questions. And the series really leads to this almost three-pronged um, theory that you have by the end of it of what the different possibilities are likely to be. Was that very similar to what you suspected at the beginning or did it take you on different, different tracks into what you ended up with as those theories? No. So that is one of the things is that you genuinely are seeing us discover, ask the questions and go from one interview to another and kind of put together these pieces that felt very disparate in the beginning. Um, but the other thing was, is the news was happening as we were filming. 
uh, a number of the people's involvement that we discussed, especially some of the higher level officials that were close to the president, you know, their involvement became more and more active as we were filming. So we saw the, the organization happening in real time. We saw the different types of information warfare that were being implemented by kind of different factions of the QAnon leadership um, while we were shooting. So we were really, I was very surprised at where we landed. Although a part of me growing up in the Middle East felt that it could be a possibility all along, um, given when you look at what QAnon was, which we concluded was a psychological operation. Um, it, it's not the only time this has happened. You know, it might have been the only time it happened in America to this extent, but we saw these same type of tactics um, and methods used across the world for different political interests at different times. So the fact that it led to an insurrection when we look at it through the lens of history and other times where operations like this have been carried out, it's not that much of a, um, it's not that unique. Mm -hmm. And you had a camera crew on the ground and you actually were there to be able to cover the insurrection because you had a sense that something like that was going to happen. What was, what was kind of the moment where you really pulled the trigger and were like, okay, like we absolutely have to have a camera there. We need to go, we need to cover this. Something's gonna happen that we really want to be able to include in this wider discussion that we're creating throughout the series. Yeah, um, very, it, it, I think like for most of the followers or anybody who had been following Q, um, you know, who was for or against it could see the writing on the wall with January 6th. Um, I think because I had been covering protests around the country prior to shooting this, there was just a sense of knowing how out of control these things can get, how quickly. And given the amount of gasoline that was being poured by Donald Trump, by Sidney Powell, by Ellen Wood, but the moment we decided that we had to capture this was when Ron Watkins, who is a former admin of Eight Coon, started offering funding to, you know, followers of QAnon that if they couldn't make it to January 6th, they would help fund their trip and starting to put up a lot more clear um, organizational efforts so that QAnon, not just the MAGA community in general, would be represented at the insurrection. So when Ron Watkins put out that tweet, we thought it was a for sure sign that there was going to be um, a huge gathering of QAnon supporters who in their mind's eye were fulfilling a prophecy that QAnon had been spewing for years and that Donald Trump was finally giving the green light for. You touched on this momentarily before, but structurally in the way that you tell the series, you really have you and Marley going out, conducting these interviews, looking at some of the information and then regrouping with each other to really go over, okay, this is what we've learned so far. This is what this person told us, but here's the questions that we now have for the next stage and where we think we want to take this story. What was the moment at which you realized that you really wanted that to be part of the narrative structure? Because it really brings the audience into the conversation and, and feels like you're having the conversation that viewers are having with themselves at the same time when they're watching. I think on some level, we always knew we had to kind of tell the story from ground zero, um, that in order to understand who QAnon was, you had to understand what QAnon was, and in order to understand, you know, and then, sorry, let me put that back. In order to understand why QAnon exists, you need to understand who could be behind it. In order to understand who could be behind it, you need to know what it is. And it seems simple, but it was very difficult. I think there weren't any resources out there that I was watching that felt like it did in a documentary, in like a long form documentary series format that was answering that question, not through the perspective of, you know, a news journalist, but the people who believe it. Um, so I think that was always very fundamentally part of what we were trying to do was expand the conversation in that sense and get a deeper understanding where the understanding that like maybe more mainstream platforms won't dive into. Um, and I think the who 
ele- element of it kind of was always the hook. It was always like, as soon as Q came out, that was the first question on our minds is like, obviously like, who is this? You know, like who could it be? Um, so I think the, the, the structure of the series came about somewhat organically um, knowing that these are the three pillars that we must address. Um, and, and yeah, it was just like, how do we make sure that that arc was represented clearly because it's so easy to go down the rabbit hole on any one of these kind of subject matter. Um, so I don't know if that answered your question. I could try to be a little more succinct than that. <laughs> it really does. And, and even on a granular granular level, there's the decision for the two of you to be in front of the camera, whether it is those moments where you're breaking down the information or even the way that you're part of the conversation on screen when you're interviewing people. And there's there's a very different look and feel and dynamic and tone to a documentary, whether you're on camera or it's talking heads. Um, why was it that you so specifically thought that that was the approach that you wanted for this one to really you know, expand upon the breadth and the tone of those conversations in that way? Well, I can speak for myself at least uh, because I've never really seen myself as a host or being an on-camera. I've always been behind the camera. Um, But for this project, a a lot of my career has been focused on trying to tell positive, uplifting, and, you know, stories that help move humanity forward in some sense. And I felt like this was a really interesting opportunity to put that to the test in a way that I hadn't before because this subject matter was so controversial and inflammatory. And I thought that if I could be on camera and host this show in a way that I didn't see, I could, I could provide the tools and, and demonstrate for people how they might be able to interact with people in their lives who have fallen down the Q rabbit hole or just conspiracy in general, that rabbit hole. And I can like model how to have the conversation in a respectful way, in a way that didn't seek to like ridicule or make fun of or put down somebody. And that was really, especially in the first episode, what we wanted to show, what we thought was really different about our approach was not doing it from this like level of seeking to just unilaterally and and uniformly condemn, you know, the 30 million plus people who believe this, but really like, try to show again, like the spectrum of followers. And maybe if, if through the conversations with like JT and Dom and Dustin, even though, you know, I think it was most effectively shown in the JT segment, you know, we're, we all lose when we move into this us versus them type of um, psychology, right? Where it's that we have to, uh, you know, distance ourselves and we can't talk to Q Q followers. In my life experience, that's only made it closer for violence to happen and for us to be at war with our neighbors. And that it felt, especially at that time, and even today to some extent, like we're dangerously close to that being the reality in America. And so given that I was, given that I grew up in a place where you know, in Israel, where we were literally at war with all of the neighbors, I just thought that maybe I could demonstrate a different way for people to have the conversation, because I think we've come to the point where everybody knows somebody who's fallen down the Q rabbit hole, or a rabbit hole, and guilt and shame just doesn't work. Um, So I hope that by hosting it and putting myself out there, and being kind of vulnerable would demonstrate to people that there's another way to have this conversation. Um, yeah. yeah. And within the delicacy of these conversations as well, you know, these are beliefs that are incredibly personal to people. And, you know, in, in the way that you manage to approach it, you manage to ask them questions, which are challenging some of the things that they believe and really probing them on matters, but you still have to balance the line of not crossing over into a space where they're gonna start feeling really defensive and closing up on you. So how did you go into a lot of these conversations and, and figure out that tight line and, and how to walk it with them? Um, I, like a lot of it was just instinctual. Like, you know, most of these conversations were two hours or more. Um, even though they were boiled down to like seven to 10 minutes. 
so you know there's a lot that we got into that i wish we could have gotten further into which was about really like you know i i think you can be strong and and stand firm in your beliefs without putting somebody else down so there was a lot of like just as an example you know there was a lot of very anti-hillary anti-obama hate i mean to me it was very hatred filled or prejudice you know kind of leaning things and for me i think it was it was very casual for me to bring up that like hey like that doesn't seem very likely you know or like how can you boil down somebody's 30 years of public service into just these few things to to kind of like come to these conclusions so i think more than people give credit for like certainly it does take some courage or it does take some gumption to like say like hey this is what i believe but walk that line between that and just you know putting somebody else down um and so it wasn't like something that we planned or coordinated it just is like who i am you know like it was just yeah it wasn't as it wasn't um planned it was just those were the conversations you know like i didn't know what jt would talk about really um but i think you got an insight into our relationship and why it is there is so much love in that relationship because we listen to each other and that's something that's earned and not like one because you can you know slam dunk on some like dunk on someone in a quippy conversation you also have such a cross section of voices that you bring into the conversation, you know, whether it's JT, you go down the whole of like 4chan and 8chan and, and with people involved in that side of things and having a former CIA operative. How much of a roadmap did you start out with if these are the people from the different backgrounds that we really want to make sure that we talk to? Um, and how much of that was almost a discovery along the way? Because we see moments throughout the show where you know, you and Marley are sitting there discussing some of the previous conversations and it's like, okay, well, these people all keep telling us that we need to go talk to this guy over here. So let's go do that. Yeah. I mean, I think that we reached out to a lot of people uh, on this series and we got very fortunate um, that the folks who were willing to talk to us, you know, did so. I think some of them really took that platform as an opportunity to, um, further and double down on many of the beliefs that were foundational to Q. And, um, you know, we, we really wanted to build for the viewer kind of like the journey of the rabbit hole, because we're not the only people who have tried to answer this question. And so I think there are certain like rites of passage that, you know, Manny or like the theory that, um, defango represents right which is this could be a troll this could all have started as a joke and he represented that and we wanted to give the viewers um a way to engage with that theory in a practical human form right like manny represented what that theory looks like robert david Steele represented what it looks like when members of the former members of the intelligence community are putting their voice behind this their voice and their credibility behind this and that's scary and so if people watching, you know, Robert David Steele felt scared, like they should, you know, like these are the beliefs that led to and the credibility that a former intelligence officer, you know, lends to movements like this. And so we just wanted to show people really what that looks like, not in a prescriptive way, not in a way where, you know, we were sitting there shaking our fingers at Robert David Steele saying, hey, like Sandy Hook really happened as we were there in that hotel conference room, but it was more like we were sitting there just being hit with like the greatest conspiracy theory record, like one after another. And just like the viewers, I think we were in a position to be like, oh, like this is where this is coming from. Like this is how decades of this type of, um, this lack of trust, with between everyday people and their institutions that govern them or weaponize, and then people are radicalized around. Um, so we just, I think we wanted to paint that picture of like, really like why that happens, but not in a way where people watch and they're like, man, like those people over there believe that these folks are eating babies. And like, certainly that's a part of the ideology, but when you dig deep into like where that comes from, you start to see why people believe it because you have this CIA officer telling you like, I know this. 
And that's, that's really hard to just write off if you're by yourself in a room watching YouTube videos versus like, you know, me and Marley having the support network that we did around us um, to help kind of uh, combat those assumptions and also put it in context. That conversation also felt like it it kind of landed in a very different tone to a lot of the other ones and that, you know, he he did come across as someone that had a little bit of that defensiveness ready at the get go, regardless of your questioning. And you could almost see it on both of your faces and, and the shift in your body language in that conversation compared to other ones where you were able to have a bit more of a shield up. What What was the difference in the environment in the room when you were having those conversations with him as opposed to the other interviews that you both did? <laughs> I mean, Robert David Steele is a wild conversation to have. So like from the top, we were hit with, again, like the greatest hits of every conspiracy theory you've ever heard. You just one after another. And so like my first instinct, I'm embarrassed to say, was to kind of make jokes or like try to like, I, I think I made a reference of being like, are you Morpheus right now? Like, I didn't know that I'm Neo, like, sitting here. And just to, like, see if he would acknowledge some of the absurd nature of what he was saying. But there was no willingness to do that, right? And that, I think, is once we started talking about Pizzagate um, and kind of the what he described as collateral damage, uh, being that people who were accused of things that they didn't do, their lives were ruined as a result of it. And I'm not talking about like the Clintons, and, you know, and we were like, but what about not just like saying like this and that, but like a lot of people's lives were affected by this thing that you actively promote. And I think at that point, kind of the something switched, I saw in his eyes. And I, I saw that a couple of times when people like suddenly identified us as, you know, press or media and then it was like you know just total shutdown uh you know he's just next question i don't know anything about this organization i've definitely been a part of and anybody on you know can easily look up um or this person that i clearly have a relation it was just complete shutdown and um i think for me like i was just stunned honestly like if i look if i think back about how I was feeling at that moment. I was just like, so surprised that this, he would be so forthright about all of these things that you would think is like really privileged information that a CIA officer has that he's now just like out to, to and, and that I think in and of itself, I trust the audience to look at that and be like, if this were true, if any of the things that this guy was saying were true, like how how could he just be out here spewing this and like nobody of no would ever kind of pay attention and he's been doing this for 30 years so you know i i, I was surprised by that conversation. that was one of the more tricky conversations uh to manage around and we got a number of threats after the fact and just you know it gets into some tricky territory and, you know, you take a lot of moments throughout the series to cut away from the interview and to debunk some of the things that are saying to say, like, there's absolutely no proof. This is definitely not true. You know, this isn't this isn't a fact at all. But at the at the same time, you could have spent the entire series doing that every 20 seconds. So how did you determine where it really felt like it was an absolute necessity to make sure that nobody felt like you were endorsing or supporting any of these ideas and that there's absolutely no truth in them? versus when you could kind of let it live on screen for a second and leave it up to the audience to, to know that. Yeah, I think a lot of them were contextual. Like a lot of them, you know, what we were, the Sandy Hook is a good example, but we always just tried to examine the human cost of each statement that was being made and knowing that there were families that were affected by Sandy Hook still out there, like being affected by these things, they like really moved um, us to saying like, no, no, we really need to make a statement. And it was, it was trying to acknowledge like the human cost of so many of these statements. Whereas some of the other statements were certainly hateful and prejudiced, um, but 
they didn't like they didn't um have that level of i guess like um active harm in the misinformation that was continuing to be caused uh, towards people who were who weren't able to defend themselves who have no method of recourse and has been that way for a while so i think for us it's like obviously like the clintons being public figures like none of these concepts were new but having you know been witnessed and been around uh, you know these type of attacks and knowing the damage that it can cause to just families, just you know, the families in the community, um, we looked at certain statements as, through that lens, and and making sure that we did our part to to debunk that at the time. Um, and you know, it's complicated. I think it was a real conversation that we had every single day that we were making this thing. Is like, where is that line, right, of not wanting to be prescriptive, trusting the audience to recognize the context that these things were being said in, but also not wanting to further platform these ideas. And I think that, you know, we, we made the choice that we have to delve into this stuff if people really want to face it and understand it and have a, the ability to confront it um, in the future, we couldn't just ignore it. So um, it's, it's kind of like a, a really tricky question and I'm proud of the way we did it um, because I don't think anything else in this space has found a way to um, to provide this level of insight into the origins of these theories as well as like how they manifest today um, and again like what do we do now you know like beyond condemning and telling people that's a lie you know uh, there's a lot of great psychology uh, and I was reading a lot about de-radicalization and, you know, how to help talk to folks who just you disagree with. And I think like every time those books really led me back to this way of thing, like how do you handle this type of stuff with compassion and love and forgiveness and grace rather than trying to just spew out, you know, facts and figures which don't resonate with anybody um on an emotional level yeah well i want to congratulate you on the way that you've managed to convey and tell this story and, and find a voice that like you said no one else in the media was really tapping into so congratulations on all, on all of that and thank you so much for this conversation no thank you i really appreciate it